Hello, art historians, and welcome to our second part of our lecture over neoclassical art. And we're going to pick up with um, France. And the reason that we need to start in France when we're really talking about um, neoclassicism is for two reasons. Number one, that's where the Enlightenment started. And if the Enlightenment and its ideas and its rebirth of rational thinking from Greece and Rome um, and a continuation of going beyond those ideas are going to start in France, then it's kind of important to start there. And also, neoclassicism is a direct reaction against Rococo. So as a result of that, we need to look into France in terms of why that rebellion is going to happen. So one of the things that's going to happen in France during this time is that France is really kind of involved in a perfect storm. They are in a drought, which means that they don't have a lot of food. Bread prices are going through the roof. Um, the tax burden is being placed on the lower class. So that is making them very unhappy because not only do they not have food, they can't afford what they do have. Um, and the upper classes, mainly the aristocracy we see featured in Rococo paintings, is um, doing just fine and kind of flaunting it in the face of these people who are starving to death. And to add insult to injury, the French king, Louis XVI, is actually going to send French troops over to help the Americans um, fight their revolution against the British. And that's going to require taxes to be raised even higher. So... A lot of people, even the upper class, are going to start to have problems with these ideas and this king and his wife, Marie Antoinette, basically doing whatever they want and spending all this money. And so discussions started to be had in these wealthy homes, these aristocratic homes in France, within these salons, where they would sit and they would discuss these enlightened ideas and what they meant for women and for abolishing slavery. So there was a lot of thinking going on in France at the time, not just necessarily um, on the part of the lower class, but also kind of the middle upper class, who was not in the landed aristocracy who had been born with money, but who were essentially you know, starting to suffer at the hands of the king and queen in the French so just like um, there was this rebellion going on against the French king and queen and the taxes and, you know, basically the mistreatment of the lower classes in France, neoclassicism is going to be a rebellion against the Rococo, which was kind of a visual of the way the upper class was living in France while the rest of the people were suffering and starving and being thrown in jail for speaking out and living under the rule of an absolute ruler. So... What is eventually going to happen is the French Revolution. They're going to be inspired by not only enlightened ideas, but by seeing those enlightened ideas take place in the American Revolution. So Rococo art um, was kind of a visual of how the upper class was living, and neoclassical is going to be a rebellion against that. And instead of focusing on frivolous things, neoclassical is worried about teaching lessons of what is good for the state. It's a moral type of art. It's politically correct. And it's about events from, the his from history, especially the classical past from Greece and Rome, which could help teach a moral lesson about how people should be. Now, just with every other time period we've talked about, there's always those artists that kind of blur the lines, if you will, between two art movements. And for this case, that kind of walking that line between Rococo and neoclassical is going to be Marie-Louise Elizabeth Vigie Lebrun. And I'll just call her Elizabeth Vigie Lebrun. And what she is known for is truly being a bridge between neoclassical and Rococo because she lived to see that transition of ideas that were behind the artwork. So Elizabeth Vigie Lebrun, her father was actually, because at this time for a woman to be an artist, they were probably trained by their fathers in their studios. But Vigie Lebrun's father died younger. So it's actually kind of incredible that Elizabeth Vigie Lebrun was self-taught. So she kind of gets her own credit in that regard. And she gains a great deal of fame because she caught the attention of Queen Marie Antoinette at that time, who was a huge fan of patronizing the arts um, she actually was a big patron of Mozart, who was from Austria, and so was Marie Antoinette. And so she became, she's kind of like Velazquez, that she's the court painter, um, essentially, of Marie Antoinette. And she painted her many, many times. Um, and the way that she painted, um, kind of a little bit hazy, a little bit of that upper-class life, 
has that Rococo look to it. But the idea behind Elizabeth Vigie Lebrun was very enlightened. And she would, for example, paint her subjects, um, especially women wearing clothes from ancient Greece and Rome that kind of went back to that time. So she has that neoclassical element to her. And she's very enlightened because she's a woman painting in a way that had never been done before. She's painting portraits and she's painting them in an incredibly naturalistic, candid way that people had really never done. In fact, one of the things that shocked people is she showed women and people smiling with like their mouth open and showing their teeth and just very candid instead of just kind of sitting like she's showing them in a very naturalistic embracing of motherhood and femininity in a way that wasn't just putting them in a painted box but by celebrating women which is a very enlightened idea at the time and celebrating women's place um she was actually allowed into the french royal academy so she was accepted as one of four women that was let in and she's kind of considered to be an international female artist because she will have to leave France during the French Revolution. She would have been beheaded by the people in the revolution who wanted the heads of the king and the queen and the upper class because she worked for Marie Antoinette. And she didn't just paint portraits of Marie Antoinette and women. She also painted men, and she would paint men in a very dignified, intelligent way. But the way that she showed women really broke the rule, she wanted to be celebrated not because she was a woman painting, but because she was a good painter. And there were people, like men, who said that she's just exploiting the females to get attention. But she was like, no, I'm showing women in an enlightened way. I'm not showing them as objects to be painted. I'm showing them as people. I'm not showing them as beautiful objects to be painted within a scene. I'm showing them as who they are, as women, as mothers, as having emotion and smiling, for God's sakes. Like that was just something like women weren't supposed to be shown smiling and happy. Um, and here she is a self-portrait of herself as a mother. Like she's just showing herself in a very different way. So the fact that she was showing women with their mouths open was just such a big thing, like just this candid, you know, women laughing, smiling, embracing life in a very naturalistic way, very enlightened way and embracing them as beautiful because they were mothers and they were sisters and they were daughters and they were wives. And she would oftentimes paint women um, in the classical garb of the past this really isn't this is modern dress from the rococo time actually very inspired by marie antoinette and the way she would dress but this was showing a woman happy and celebrating being a woman and not just an object to be painted within a scene so for example this is a woman who looks like she's wearing a dress from ancient greece almost like a peplos or a you know toga and she's got laurel grapevines you know around her head and her hair is loose and flowing and just very naturalistic, but it's got that Rococo softness at the same time. She really is kind of in between the two times. So I just, I like this picture of me and Gretchen um, from when Gretchen was a baby and she's giving me um, very much a big baby kiss. Like she's kind of just attacking my face and the laugh that I'm laughing with my mouth open was just a very natural moment for me as a mother. Like I just, I, I really equate how she was painting just showing me, like, if she was to paint this scene, that's what she would paint. Like, it's me naturally as I am instead of posing. Um, I'm posing, you know, not really posing. I'm, what am I trying to say? It's just me. Like, it's, it's me as a woman, not just an object within a scene. So she's got the antiquity and these enlightened ideas from the past that women were important. Um, and this enlightened idea that women are worth being shown as they are within their sphere, because at this point, this was a woman's sphere, but it's not a lesser sphere. It's still, you know, they're happy. There's, you know, pride in being a woman, but still having that Rococo softness to it. So these are some of her famous paintings that she did of Marie Antoinette. And you can tell that very early on, she was a Rococo painter like that was she, you know, came of age and started working in this Rococo time period. And here she is painting Marie Antoinette and Madame de Pompadour in these very, you know, fancy, you know, dresses and the Rococo lifestyle. But 
then as neoclassicism and the enlightenment started to become more popular she started to change the way she showed marie even and instead of marie being shown flaunting her status and her wealth if you will as she did here she starts to be shown as a good mother that that's her treasures instead of all of this wealth and all of these beautiful dresses and wigs that she has her children here are her treasures and she's pointing to them kind of this enlightened idea that of the exemplum virtuitous of i'm a good person so it still looks very rococo very soft very hazy but kind of this new philosophy behind how a woman should be shown this is one of the most famous paintings of marie antoinette and it's marie antoinette with her children and you'll notice that there is an empty cradle next to her because she had lost one of her children and so it's showing her that like time has kind of hardened her a little bit but She's setting a good example that my first job is as a mother and raising the future children and the you know prince and princesses of this state. So still that Rococo softness, but definitely with that enlightened idea of what a painting should be for. So the painting for the 250 that they've asked you to know is Marie Vigie Lebrun's self-portrait. And here she is painting herself as a painter in a very candid moment with her mouth open, with the you can see her teeth, um, just kind of this very quick shot of her very natural as she would actually look if she turned around and kind of looked at you in that moment. And she's painting this portrait from memory. The, the portrait that she's painting is of Marie Antoinette, and Marie Antoinette is older here as she's painting her, but she has to paint it from memory because she had to leave because Marie Antoinette was killed. So she's showing herself with the tools of her trade with you know doing what she does not to be celebrated as a court painter but as her skill as a painter and how good she was at what she did and Vigila Brun and her daughter had to leave Paris in the late 1700s during the neoclassical movement during, which inspired these ideas so the enlightenment is the driving force behind the neoclassical movement and the enlightenment is also what led to these revolutionary movements and she had to leave like she had to get out of uh, Paris or else she would have been executed um, for what she did. She did return to Paris and she did do self portraits of herself and here she is painting Marie Antoinette from memory because she never would have seen her again after you know she had to leave and run away. So she actually has a little bit of a look to her from Rubens like she's very much into the idea of naturalism and that Baroque lighting to do it but it's a Rococo softness but with that enlightened idea of don't honor me because I'm a woman painting honor me because of how good I am as a painter and not just because of who I painted but how I can paint as she is showing herself doing here. So now we're going to look at um, another person in France who's going to be involved in not only the neoclassical movement, but also the revolution. And that's going to be Jacques-Louise David. All right. And David, if there's anything I can say about David, it's that he's an opportunist. Um, David was just desperately trying to serve whoever would not kill him during the time. And uh, David was actually trained by a Rococo artist named Boucher, the one who did the girl reclining that we looked at in Rococo that we were kind of like, that was not meant for public viewing. And even though he was trained by a Rococo painter, he's incredibly different than Boucher. He had completely different ideas about um, what painting should be. And I really think that's again, because David is an opportunist and he's going to do what will get him the most attention and also not get him killed. So the ironic thing about him is David actually got his fame by starting by working for Louis the 16th, who was the king at the time of the revolution in France. He's the one who's going to help America fight the revolution. He's also going to be the one that gets beheaded along with Marie Antoinette in their revolution. And David, part of his difference is he had been to Rome. He'd been classically trained. So that means he's got that Greek and Roman training. He's got a Baroque look to him because he's been training in Italy during when they're still stuck in the Baroque. And he said whenever he went to Rome, he felt like he'd been operated on for a cataract, which means he felt that he was now able to see 
you know, better about what painting should be and what should it should be about. So he and his followers actually tried to show so much that they hated Rococo that they would go throw bread at um, Rococo paintings to show just how much they thought Rococo was fake and not truly worthy of art. So this painting, and it's very important for you to understand who this was originally commissioned for. David got his start working for, just like Marie Vigie Lebrun, starting by working for the royal family. So he's kind of like a Velazquez, um, and he's going to be painting for Louis the Sixteenth. And Louis the Sixteenth, the king, asked him to paint this particular painting because Louis wanted to remind his people that their loyalty first and foremost was to France, not to themselves, not to their own ideas, but to France. And he wanted this painting, Louis the Sixteenth wanted David to paint this painting as a way to send that message. So this story right here, what makes it classical is number one, it's in a classical setting. That's very Roman architecture that's in the background. You can see they're wearing Roman togas and on the left you have Roman soldiers. Their father is holding their swords and they are taking an oath, making a pledge to their father that their first and foremost loyalty is going to be to their family and to their state above anything else, that this family is taking that oath. Now you can tell David's got a little bit of Baroque training to him. He trained in Rome. He's got that tenebrism highlighting the different important things. You've got the light reflecting off the swords, off the men who have their arms wrapped around each other, that they're going to support each other, and then spotlighting on the two women who are over here crying. Now, this is actually a story from ancient Rome, a story that happened in Rome. That So that's that neoclassical of using a classical story from the past for a new reason. So this story is called the, the Oath of the Horatii or the Oath of the Horati. I've heard it pronounced both ways, and honestly, I don't care. You get the point. So this story is three brothers who are making an oath to their father that they are going to die in defending their city from an enemy family, the Curatii, all right? It's kind of like a mafia family problem. It's basically Jersey versus New York, right? And who is your loyalty going to be for? So the three brothers are in this, are part of this city and part of this family who's fighting against the Curatii family. So they're swearing above anything else that they're going to fight and die for their country, their city state, that that is what their loyalty is to not to themselves. So the problem is this gets a little bit uglier because one of the women off to the side crying is crying because she's married to one of the Kurashii. She's married to one of the men of the, the other family and she's begging her brothers, please don't kill my husband. And they end up killing the sister because her loyalty is to her husband and not to her family. The entire exemplum virtuitous behind this, the, exem the exemplary um, example, this virtue, is loyalty and sacrifice. That is what Louis XVI wanted his people to see very publicly, and it's painted very clearly with very clear outlines and very clear detail so they get the clear message. Your loyalty is not to yourself. It is to your state above anything else, even if that means killing your own family. So this is in 1784, which is when Louis XVI was still in power, and so was Marie Antoinette, but things were starting to get a little bit rough in France at the time. So he was having this painted to remind them that, hey, your loyalty is to France above anything else. You're supposed to be patriotic, and it set this example. Look what they did in ancient Rome. That's what you need to be doing. They're using a classical story from the past to reinforce a modern idea, right? So there's a very deep thing to it. But the irony about this is the people in, in 1789 in the French Revolution are going to see this as actually supporting their cause. The revolutionaries are going to say that your loyalty should be to France, not to your king, and Louis' plan is completely going to backfire with this particular painting. So we see all these... He's definitely classically trained in Rome. We've got Doric columns. We've got arches. It's a classical story from ancient Rome. 
very good linear perspective is back, that tenebrism to highlight the ideas of strength and the swords, Roman clothing, and it's this idea of very rational, not emotional. It's This is what it is. You are supposed to support your family and your state above anything else. Okay, so we now have neoclassical sculpture, all right? And neoclassical sculpture is going to follow the exact same idea. It's nothing different. They are going to use subjects from the past to send a modern message. There's a reason they're using Greek and Roman subjects in this, all right? So what we're going to see here is they're going to, neoclassical is typically always done in white marble, which is what they thought the Greeks did in the past. But it wasn't. The Greeks and Romans painted a lot of their sculptures. But because a lot of that paint had chipped off, they now think that, okay, it has to be white. But that white was meant to be images of purity and truth. All right, so a really good example of this, I already showed you with Napoleon. Like, Napoleon was, um, he showed himself as Mars the peacekeeper. Why did he choose to have himself shown as Mars? Because Mars is the god of war, and through war he brought peace. Napoleon used something from the classical past to send a modern message. Why did his sister want to be shown as Venus? Because she could be shown topless, and she could be shown as a goddess of love, which is what she wanted to portray herself. So here we have a neoclassical sculpture by Jean-Antoine Houdon, a French sculptor, who did a sculpture of George Washington, all right? And if you see here, all right, there is a lot, it doesn't really look like it's from the classical past, all right? At first glance, it looks like George Washington is wearing his uniform the way he would have worn it. He's shown as he would actually look. So at first glance, this doesn't really look like it's referencing any, anything from the past, but the truth is there's a lot of classical reference here. So George Washington um, did not want to be shown like this. This was originally what was brought to him by two different artists. One of them is Canova, who did the sculptures of Napoleon and his sister. Another one is Greenlee. And they were like, okay, we're going to show you as a Greek god. We're going to show you as Zeus. Washington, what is that? What do you think about that? And he's like, I don't want to be shown topless. And I don't want to be shown as a king because Zeus was a king that would send the wrong message. Okay, but they're like, but the Greeks invented democracy and you're the first leader of our democracy. And he's like, that's fine, but don't show me as a topless Greek god to be worshipped. Okay, so then Canova shows him as George Washington as a Roman soldier, right? Sitting here in his military breastplate, shown as a, a Roman general. And they're like, but you were a general, George, and you're shown now as a great leader from the past, like the Roman generals. And he's like, I'm done fighting. This is sending the wrong message. I want something different. And they're like, but we're a republic. Rome was a republic. You're shown as a Roman general. Still not what he wanted, all right? So what he kind of started to notice, he's like, I'll be happy with whatever is decent and proper, all right? I should, scare, should even scarcely have ventured to suggest that perhaps an adherence to the garb of antiquity might not be okay. He's like, don't dress me in the past. I don't want to be shown as somebody in the past. I don't want to be shown shirtless, all right? So he actually learned of a sculptor named Houdon. And Houdon had been following this example of a new artist in England called Benjamin West. And Benjamin West was actually American and left America. He was a patriot. He actually, he is not a, he supported the king and queen. So he wouldn't fight for the Revolutionary War. He fought kind of on the British side. And he went over to Britain and was painting this new style of historical painting that was about the modern present, that the modern story can be just as powerful as the past. So Washington was kind of like, why don't we do that? Can't you have me dressed in modern style and it still be an important scene just because I'm not dressed in something from the past? Can it still be just an important story if it's from now? So Thomas Jefferson was actually the one who hired Houdon because Jefferson had been to France all the time and he knew of Houdon and he was like, okay, 
this guy is good. Houdon would be great to do this sculpture. So here is what they did, all right? George Washington is shown in a military uniform. However, it's his sword, if you look over here on the right, his sword is hung up. He's not a soldier anymore. He was one. But you'll notice that even he's missing a button. It's such good detail on the marble that he's missing a button. Like, basically, he's kind of let his image go. He's got a little bit of a belly. He's kind of retired from that kind of life. The uniform doesn't quite fit him as much anymore because he's not really a soldier anymore. He wants to be a citizen of this country. So he has put aside his sword and left it off to the side where he can't even really reach it. And instead, he's got a walking stick, like a regular civilian, which is not a weapon. So he's shown in a contraposto classical Greek stance, paying tribute to the classical Greeks because he is the father of democracy. He is our first president. So it's because I'm showing myself in a Greek stance, like a Greek sculpture, I'm kind of going back to the Greeks and their idea of democracy. And it's in that white marble, which is from the past. But behind him is actually a plow. And it's an ancient plow. And it comes from a story from ancient Rome, who there was a soldier named Cincinnatus. All right, so like think Cincinnati, Cincinnatus. And Cincinnatus had been an amazing general and then decided to put aside his soldiering and go and be a farmer instead and be one of his people. So to kind of show he's not really a Caesar, he's more of a Cincinnatus. So after he won, he gives up his power to become a civilian, recognizing the fact that any power he has comes from the government, that he is just a civilian. He did not want to be shown as a god like Zeus. Instead, he's like, let's pay some tribute to Greece. But at the same time, let's make it clear that I'm a modern hero. You'll also see that he's shown here with what's called a fascist. Now, yes, that is like fascism, but don't, don't go there yet, all right? The fascists like Mussolini took this symbol and corrupted it. But you'll see here that joined together is a bundle of sticks that he's leaning on. And that bundle of sticks is tied together like the you know original colonies, the 13 states, because together they're hard to break. One by themselves can be broken, but united together. And this is a symbol from ancient Rome that together we are stronger than we are separate. So that's another classical reference. Now, neoclassical architecture, same thing. If they're using a Greek or Roman reference in their architecture, there's a reason for it. And in our country, the United States, which is not everybody's country, but in the United States, during the neoclassical movement from 1750 to 1800, we are establishing our country. We're creating the first democratic republic since Rome, a true democracy where people are elected and not just like Rome where you were in the Senate because you were a wealthy landholding male. True democratic republic. So our capital was designed to represent those values of how do you know that we're going to be a democracy? We have Greek architecture. How do you know that we're going to be a republic? We have a Roman dome. How do you know that we're separating church and state? Because we have Greek gods and goddesses sitting in front of our buildings to show that Christianity is not part of this. Plus, they are balanced. Greek architecture was about perfection and balance between two parties, between ideas, finding a balance. And even homes started to have that look of putting a Greek pediment, a triangular pediment and columns on the front in that classical style. Now, all of this came from an architect who was over in Rome called Andrea Palladio, who you do need to know because import he's important for context. Palladio is gonna have more influence on American architecture than any other architect at that time. This guy actually wrote four books on architecture of how architecture should be. He's considered to be mannerist by some people because of the things that he did, but in all actuality, he was trying to just be as rational and balanced as possible. And I'll show you some of his stuff that really looks weird, but there's a true reason behind it. Thomas Jefferson adored Palladio. In fact, he learned Italian 
just so that he could read Palladio's books. And Palladio's style was so influential on that style that Jefferson brought in helping shape how our you know, United States Capitol and even Virginia looked. So, for example, this is a Palladian building. This is by Andrea Palladio, and it's called Villa Rotunda, right? Which means the round house. But if you look at this, it's not round. It's square. But the idea is that each side of it looked exactly the same. In his mind, he was like, that's rational have an entrance on every side of the building that looks exactly the same. And that way people can, because these were built up on hills, like very high hills, these Roman villas. And they could look out over these sprawling vineyards and all of this land. And just like Roman style buildings, they were built up on a pedestal so that it could overlook, you know, the trees and the scenery and see everything. And here you've got four Roman style temple fronts all the way around it with a round dome on the top. And what he did is I like to say that Palladio domesticated the dome. Like he basically made the dome okay to not just put on a church or a government building, but also a private home like Villa Rotunda. And here you can take a look at this for a second and see what you think. There's a lot of people who are like, I really like it. There's an entrance to every side of the house and every side looks exactly the same. And then there are people like, that's mannerist. That doesn't make sense. You basically put an entrance on every side of the house. And he's like, no, that makes perfect sense. You can get in from every side. Okay. This is also another one in Venice by Palladio. This is San Giorgio Maggiore, which... I don't know if anybody's a Game of Thrones fan, and if you are, but they kind of modeled Bravos off of um, Venice a little bit when Arya goes to Venice. I don't know if you've never seen it. I'm really sorry. But this building, this church kind of reminds me of that. And he basically put this, you'll notice there used to be a different church there. He basically put this neoclassical temple front on it, but he had a problem because it had a wider nave at the bottom and it was taller. So he basically was like, okay, I'll put a wider bottom and then make it appear that that is behind a taller part. And people are like, this is just absolutely hideous, Palladio. There it is right there. I don't know. Um, I'll let you read this if you want to, but this is an art critic from the time who absolutely hated Palladio. Palladio was not liked really very much over in Italy. Um, they said his stuff doesn't make sense. But man, did Jefferson love him. And his stuff may not have continued on in Italy a whole lot, but it definitely did in Rome, or excuse me, in the United States. So eventually what's going to happen is there are going to be people who visit Italy on this tour of Europe that people would do. And they saw works of art by like Palladio. And they started to be like, wow, I want a Roman style villa in my home. So we start to see England, which doesn't quite get it by the time it gets there, but they were creating what they thought were Roman style villas in their country in England. But what they were really creating was Palladian style villas. So you can see, for example, here, this kind of looks like Villa Rotunda in England. Um, this is called Chiswick House. All right. And the weird thing about it is this house wasn't even meant to be a house. It didn't have a kitchen or bathrooms or anywhere to sleep. It was basically meant as an art gallery to show off classical art in a classical style villa. I mean, just kind of over the top a little bit. So down here at the bottom is Palladio's Villa Rotunda. At the top, you have Chiswick House in England. There it is again. I just can't stand it. All right. Now, I do want to throw in another part of this if we're talking about neoclassical architecture, because during the 1750s, England actually experienced their industrial revolution and they started making advances in iron. So one of the things we start to see is instead of bridges and things like that being built out of stone or wood, which were time consuming and could deteriorate easily, they started creating iron bridges and eventually steel because iron does rust so what we see here is for example this is a coal bridge in england and what's crazy about it is they basically took a roman style classical arch and created it 
using iron instead. It's kind of like this, well, the past is so good, we can't really change it. So let's just use the past using modern materials. So for example, this little you know, bridge right here in England. Why does this matter to you? Because that style of building and that idea of using new materials, modern materials like steel and classical architectural techniques is gonna make its way all the way over here to St. Louis um, and also you know, basically across the United States. And so we have the Eads Bridge, which James Eads used Roman style arches using Carnegie steel to create this bridge that spans the Mississippi River and has for over a hundred years. So it's gonna make its way over here. And this is actually in the cemetery that I work at. This is in Bell Fountain Cemetery. This is Eads sarcophagus. He's actually buried below it, but this is neoclassicism at its finest. It just takes a little bit longer to get over here across the Atlantic Ocean. You'll see that he's buried in a Roman style sarcophagus to give tribute to the fact that he was a great engineer and used Roman style techniques in his engineering. That is neoclassical, using the past to send a modern message. So neoclassical architecture is gonna make its way all over Europe. Um, Napoleon um, III in France is going to use it. Actually, Napoleon Bonaparte himself is going to use it because Napoleon wanted Paris to be the new Rome because remember, Napoleon was not French, he was Italian. So we see this revival of Greek and Roman architecture arise all over Paris. So for example, the Paris Opera House, the Paris Pantheon, that is a church, believe it or not, the Church of Saint Genevieve. The Champs Elysees, um, right here, the Arc de Triomphe, which was commissioned by Napoleon as a Roman style victory arch. And they, um, he never did get to see it completed, but his body did pass under it whenever they brought him through to Paris to be buried finally after exile. And the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier for um, the French is actually located underneath the Arc de Triomphe or the Arch of Triumph, because remember the Romans believed that crossing under an arch was a way of soldiers transferring from army life to civilian life or passing from, if they died, this world to the next world. So it's kind of like that tribute to these French soldiers. And there's the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier underneath it. So classicism and classical architecture, because our country was in the middle of our revolution and establishing this democratic republic, it was very purposeful that we chose Greek and Roman architecture in order to demonstrate what our values were going to be. And Thomas Jefferson was going to be critical in that. He was highly, highly influenced by Palladio and also by Roman architecture that he saw in France, including a building called Maison Carrie, which is a Roman style temple located in the middle of France. And he would study it and draw it and sculpt it. And just for hours, he stared at this building. And that building plus Palladio style were extremely influential in his choice to use Greek and Roman architecture here in the establishment of our country and our nation's capital because it is balanced, it is rational, and it is firm, just like America was supposed to be. So this is Maison Carrie right here in France, so the one on the top left. That is a Roman style temple in the middle of France because remember the Romans did take over France and built everywhere they were. Over here on the right, that's gonna be the University of Virginia, which is going to be designed by Thomas Jefferson. This is the Virginia State Capitol designed by Thomas Jefferson, modeled off of Maison Carrie, balanced, rational, orderly, thinking, that's what democracy is supposed to be, all right? Um, University of Virginia has that not only Roman look to it, 